What's up, YouTubers and fellow builders? So, I'm nearing the end of all my stick welding videos. Not for the long term, but at least for the short term. I've covered a ton of stick welding videos, more than enough to help you guys out. And I'll dabble back in it here and there, but I'm going to be starting some flux core wire videos, just a few, and then get into MIG welding pretty fast here. But I thought I would cover something that I think would be infinitely useful to you guys that are learning to stick weld. And even if you're kind of decent at stick welding, it really help you improve. And this is sort of a, not a repeat video, but I covered this information before. But what we're going to cover in this video is a little bit more about how to read the puddle. Because I've gotten a lot of comments and emails and questions regarding what a person should be looking at. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about, and I'm going to be more specific on my arc footage to help you guys get a better idea. So let's start out. So myself and everybody else that shoots welding videos on YouTube, we all have arc footage, and that arc footage is great, but, well, for one, it's generally a pretty up-close view of what the puddle looks like, but unless you're face mask or your hood is like down this close the weld pool doesn't look as distinct or cl the clarity isn't there for most of us that are welding especially if you're getting older like i am and your eyesight sucks and you're too ignorant to use cheater lenses or reading glasses whatever hey we all have our problems right well anyways all the arc footage in the world is awesome because it gives you a great idea of what it should look like, but how relevant is that from your point of view? I find that when I weld, I simply don't need to see the weld pool as good as you might suspect. And if you focus too much on just that weld pool, well, guess what? You're not gonna, A, or one, be able to see where you're going, because if all you're focusing on is that little weld pool, with stick, you're, you're not going to see where you're going. You're not going to pay attention to your rod angle and everything else. And doing a good stick weld, you're kind of balancing so many things. You're balancing your travel speed. You're balancing your rod angle. You're balancing how much you're feeding in. You're balancing your rod angle this way as it, the rod shortens, everything. And to focus on just one thing, you're going to miss everything else. So what I'm going to do is set up a couple exercises here where one of them being I'm going to weld towards myself, which obscures, significantly obscures the weld pool. And I'm going to show you that even though you can't see a perfect weld pool, you can still make quality welds. So we're going to start out with that first, and then we're going to get into a bunch of other exercises and my thoughts on how to uh, better understand what's going on without hyper-focusing on one or two things. So let's start on that. So we'll start off with some arc footage here. And I shot this in a way that I think it accurately represents what you probably see. So it's a little bit less detailed, a little bit zoomed out. So when you look at this, it's a little bit harder to really tell what's going on. That's all right. We're going to watch this again and I'll slow it down and we'll look at it. So I slowed this down. It's a little bit funky to watch, but that's all right. I struck the arc, moved forward a little bit. My puddle is established already and it's about two times as long as the rod is wide with flux and about one and a half times as wide as the rod. And I'm just slowly dragging that along. If that puddle gets longer than what you see here, you're going to be moving too slow. And if the puddle gets taller, you're moving too slow. If it disappears, you're simply moving too fast. If you notice too that as I'm welding, the light output stays pretty consistent on this. That's another telltale sign that your arc gap is not changing. So in this weld, I'm going to weld towards the camera. 
This is a little bit harder to do in real life, but it's still possible. Now, if you watch this, the molten puddle is about the size of the rod, maybe a little bit hangs over both sides. That's about perfect right there. You see how it's starting to get much, much wider than the rod? That's an indication that I'm moving too slow. You're going to watch it neck down a little bit. See how it disappeared? Now I'm moving too fast. You want to be able to see just a little bit, just like that right there. And now I'm moving too slow again. It's widening out, widening out. So we can see here about the first quarter of the plate looks about perfect. The second quarter, much wider than the first, and that's because the travel speed was slower. The second quarter, or excuse me, the third quarter got a little bit neck down as I sped up, but then it got wider again and finished a little bit wider than what we want, again, because the travel speed uh, slowed down. So here's another example. Right here, we're moving the correct speed. Everything's looking good. Now I'm slowing down a little bit. You can see the puddle's gonna rise and it's gonna widen because my travel speed is too slow. Too slow. Now I'm gonna speed up and you're gonna watch the puddle completely disappeared because I'm moving too fast. So here's the actual weld. I didn't clean the flex off, but we can tell a lot already. I welded it right to left, and the right side, about the first inch, looks good. And then as the travel speed slowed down, you can see how it humped up and widened out. And then after about the halfway point, I moved way too fast, didn't deposit much metal. The interesting thing is there is an actual bead under all of that. It's just that it necked down. The reason I don't have breaks in the bead is because I kept a really tight arc length the whole length. So if you see breaks in your bead, it's probably because you're picking the rod up off the plate. Well, like most things in life, it takes three tries to get it right. I did this twice, couldn't quite get the arc footage right, and got it a little bit better on this last one. But something I want to talk about here. So you saw me go fast and slow, and you saw how the puddle lengthened and it widened depending on if you were going fast or slow. And obviously, if you're running too much amperage, it's going to lengthen as you move or go wider or burn a hole. You get that picture. But a really good way to determine speed is this is a 4-inch plate, which is 10.16 uh, centimeters for you metric people. If you just chuck a rod and a stinger with your welder off and just practice going about this fast and just try and be very consistent in your speed, that will help you. Now I uploaded a little short video using a Sharpie as an electrode. You should do that as well. It will help you. But as you can see, this is about the speed you want to travel for eighth inch and quarter inch plate with 332 rod, which is what I have here. Now I did upload again a, a different video where I gave actual speeds with eighth inch rod and 332. That's also of interest to you to look up and, and study. But like I said, the, you want to go slow. Now the issue always comes up is this is quarter inch plate. I can run slow on this because I'm not at risk of burning a hole. If you're trying to weld eighth inch plate, what's slow for quarter inch may burn a hole straight through eighth inch or even say 16th inch. You know, that leeway there is, is significantly smaller when you go with thinner plates. So what's too slow and too fast is <laughs> the, the difference is minute. And which brings up a point that someone had I think they left a comment or something or messaged me. They wanted to get a better idea how to weld different thicknesses and that they struggled like figuring out amperage for thick to thin and, you know, thin versus thick. And it all comes down to controlling your travel speed using the correct size rod and using the correct amperage, which obviously that's easy to say. 
hard to do. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So to become a better welder, you need to think like a welder. And to think like a welder, you need to ask yourself, what's the easiest possible frickin' way that you can do something? <laughs> like being lazy has its benefits, and if you apply to welding in the right way, it will be beneficial. And what I mean by that is, you want to, from right from out the gate, set yourself up to make things easy. So, if you have thin material, steel, you need to ask yourself, well, what's the right size rod to be welding with this? My general rule is if the rod you're trying to weld the material with is bigger than the material is, so larger diameter, and for this it's 1 16th, if you're going to try and use a 332 rod on that, you're going to have a real hard time welding it. Now, quarter inch, obviously, they do make quarter inch rods. You'll, you'll personally probably never run them. I mean, it's very high amperage, but quarter inch plate, you wouldn't want to use a bigger than quarter inch rod. And so pretty much everything under quarter inch rod is going to be acceptable. Now, one eighth material, you can weld that with 332. You could technically weld it with eighth inch rod, but you're again, you're going to have a difficult time. So right out the gate, Determine the thickness of the material you're welding and size your rod appropriate. So for this sheet metal, your two best options, 1 16th and 5 64ths, which it's going to be very, very difficult for you to see the difference on those. There you go. You can see there are slightly different. These are your go-to rods. Set yourself up, not for failure, but for success. Small rod there. Now for eighth inch material like this 332 very good bet on that or you could use 564s if you're having issues blowing a hole in it but 564s 332 way to go with eighth inch now for thicker steel like quarter inch you really have two options sure you could weld it with 332 but you're going to have an issue, to be honest, with that. And that issue is you're going to have to feed a lot of rod. And it's going to be difficult to get the heat input to get good fusion. So my recommendation is 8th inch rods or 532 rods for this quarter inch plate. That will help you out. The other thing you need to ask yourself, because again, you need to think like a welder, is the rod choice that I'm using for this particular job, the right choice. Now I love 6010, which is this rod right here. Great rod. Is this the right choice for a thin sheet metal like this? I would say definitely not. The second you strike a arc, it's gonna blow a hole. Is this a right choice for eighth inch? Probably not. Even if this was a 332 rod on eighth, you may have a little bit of an issue with over penetration, even with 332. It's doable, but that's going to be tough. Now, is this 532, or excuse me, this 6010 and eighth inch rod the proper rod for quarter inch? Yeah, it would work good. You're not at risk of blowing a hole, and it's going to be very easily controllable. So again, picking your rod type for what you're welding on will also avoid a lot of issues. Now, if your plan is to weld eighth inch to quarter inch, the question comes up, well, what rod should you use? Should you use a rod that's suitable more so for quarter or more so suitable for the thinner part? And I guess that's a pretty complex answer to that. And it really depends. So if you're in a fillet weld like this, I would say that 332 rods would probably work just fine. Eighth inch likely would because your rod angle is going to favor the thicker plate in this situation. If this was quarter and that was eighth, you'd probably be better off using 332. And the reason is, is that if you were to use an eighth inch rod, you're going to have to come in almost flat like this because if you're rod angle is like this and you're using eighth inch rod you're going to have a tendency to melt through the bottom 
if this was eighth inch material. So this would be a good example. Quarter inch, eighth inch, use 332. So it all depends on the position, what part's thicker, what part's thinner. But generally speaking, you want to downsize your rod to where if it's quarter to eighth, use 332, it'll give you the most leeway. But the more skill you have, the bigger the rod you can generally run and get away with. So with that said, let's talk a little bit about amperage. One of the most common issues that people focus on is the amperage issue. And I'm here to tell you that amperage for, with stick welding, as long as you're close to the correct amperage for the rod, is almost irrelevant. And let me explain. Both of these welds were welded with the same rod, the same values, okay? Same welder, everything, and they were done back to back. What do you think the difference is? Well, the answer is the consistency in how I moved. This is an inconsistent rod angle, arc gap, and travel speed creates that. And you compare how this weld looks to this, nothing changed other than I was far more consistent. And I'll prove it to you. I'll show you a video right now. So I know this isn't arc footage, but just listen to the way that this sounds. Look at the amount of time it takes me to go start to finish and how inconsistent the light output is that's telling you there's issues. I didn't change anything for the second pass that's coming up. Same amperage, same machine, nothing's changed. I'm just going to run it at the proper speed and watch how much different it looks. I slowed way down and was just flat out more consistent. So as you saw in that video where I actually welded this, consistency is everything. Your amperage, like focusing on amperage, is really, like I said, irrelevant. I could have been 10 amps higher, 10 amps lower, doesn't matter. I would have made a weld very similar to this. And the reason is, is that my Travel speed was almost identical. My arc gap, identical start to finish. And that is really what stick welding comes down to more than anything, is just nailing your travel speed and being consistent start to finish. That's what it takes to go from this to get to here. It has nothing to do with amperage. It has nothing to do with rod size. I could have done the same thing. This was eighth inch rod. I could have done that with 332, I could have done that with 532, I could have done the same thing with 1 16th rods, even though, honestly, those little guys over here kind of are bastards because they, they flex so much, they shake. But you get the picture. Now, there, there is something to be said with amperage, though, and that's much like your rod size, where you pick the correct size rod for what you're welding, your amperage needs to be in the range of what the rod is designed to run. And that's very simply put, if you try and run, say, a 1 16th rod at 100 amps, the rod's gonna blow apart. If you try and run an eighth inch rod at 80 amps, it's gonna be hard to start and not produce any kind of fusion. So that's why it's important to get a chart or look at the rod manufacturer's guidelines online or on the package to get an idea of what the amperage range is and then start off in the middle of it. Now for 7018, 332, I run them 90 to 100 amps. For eighth inch, I run 120, 130. The only exception to that, that's for flat plate. If I run vertical up, I reduce the amperage 
by 10 to 15 amps depending on rod and that's generally about it and again it goes back to you know yeah could you weld with an eighth inch rod over there on i don't know eighth inch material absolutely and you may have to get it all the way down to say 95 amps but that's far from ideal and the odds of blowing a hole or producing a poor weld are just it the more skill i guess i'll put it to you this way guys the more skill you have the more you can get away with with mismatches of rod size amperage all of that that comes with skill so in conclusion i know that i covered a lot of this stuff that i talked in this video in every other video i've done about stick welding and if i say it a lot of times it's because it's important and I kind of have the thought, the more I say it, the more you'll probably remember it. And the more the little voice in your head when you're doing things tells you, hey, something's wrong, fix it. Hey, do this. Hey, do that. Like, that's how you become a better welder or really good at anything is when that little voice in your head tells you, hey, do this a little bit different and it'll be better. And then you do that and then you see the results firsthand. And that's what it's all about. And that's the whole point I've shared all of these stick welding videos with you guys is because I want to give you a solid baseline to where you understand how I do what I do. And going forward, I probably won't be doing too many more stick welding video how-tos. I will cover occasionally, but if I happen to have a hot job that comes through that I have to fix up and I stick weld, I'm not going to be covering so much of the how I did it. It's more like the this is what I did type videos. And I think you guys get the idea on that. But without a bunch of videos to show you how I do everything, so I can say, hey, watch this and it'll, it'll tell you. It's just kind of me just talking about stuff and you're clueless. So I didn't want that to happen. But with that said, I'm glad that you stuck around for my stick welding series. And I'm going to be getting into MIG and flux core pretty soon. So that'll be fun, something different, especially MIG welding. I know all of you guys have been hounding me. Well, not all of you, a lot of you, about getting into MIG. So I'm going to get into that. And we're going to learn a lot, and we'll see what happens. So anyways, thanks for sticking around for the video. Till next time.